Thank you all for coming. My name is John Dugan. I'm Director of Planning and Community Development for San Antonio. And speaking with me this morning is Doug Melnick, the Director of our Office of Sustainability, and Terry Bellany, Assistant Director for Transportation and Capital Improvements for the City of San Antonio. We're going to be talking about uh, a major initiative of three plans, a comprehensive plan, a sustainability plan, and a multimodal transportation plan that are all being done in conjunction with each other to bring San Antonio up to date in the 21st century for all sorts of different kinds of planning for the future. I'm going to run through the comprehensive plan, where we are on that, and then Terry is going to talk about the sustainability plan, and then Excuse me, uh, Doug is going to talk about the sustainability plan, and Terry will talk about the multimodal transportation plan. Now, we've got about two hours worth of presentation here, and so we're just going to have 15 minutes, so this is going to go pretty quick. If you're interested in more details, please see us afterward, but we want to leave you some time um, after our presentation for questions and discussion. So let me launch into Essay Tomorrow. Essay Tomorrow is based upon a vision, the vision for a future of the city that was founded in SA 2020, a collaborative process involving thousands of citizens that really put together a key vision for the city of the future for San Antonio. Environmental sustainability, transportation, great neighborhoods, a really healthy and fit city, a city that's safe, that has really good downtown development, has arts and culture and great education, a family well-being, good economic jobs and competitiveness, a lot of civic engagement to become a really world-class city in the 21st century. So this was a great vision, and everybody bought into it. But the big question was, how do you implement that? How do you turn that vision into reality? So that's what our comprehensive plan, sustainability plan, and transportation plans are all about. And it's all together called Essay Tomorrow. We have a great website that goes into great detail on all of these different procedures as we move along. We are starting out with a, and I'll talk about the comprehensive plan now, a steering committee made up of leadership in the community. Councilman Nirenberg from the council has a committee of council that coordinates the whole process. Uh, Dr. Elnicott from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Daryl Bird, who was the chair and manager of the whole SA, Tomorrow, SA 2020 program. We're working with uh, technical experts that have been nominated from in working groups, nine different working groups, from the major institutions and organizations of the city, some 85 uh, organizations with 160 people working on these different working groups. And we're right now starting to work out into a lot of community meetings to talk, start engaging with the public about the process. Uh, the community meetings, this is an example of the working groups, talk about all the different issues and opportunities and challenges and what the future could be for the city in all sorts of different types of themes themes to do with the transportation and different details we'll try to show in a minute, but the common themes that are coming out now of about three months worth of discussion uh, from these working groups is that the city's future must put people first. The planning must address the needs of all the residents and provide a variety of options and choices. Affordability and diversability should be emphasized and the policies have to provide be provided at a lot of scales, not just big long term, not just big city issues, but also down at the neighborhood level. And focus on centers and quarters, particularly transit quarters. We just had a great presentation on complete streets. We've got potential for a lot of complete streets here, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And we should really focus on amenity-based neighborhoods. All the neighborhoods should be designed to be healthy and designed to be amenity-based, and we'll talk about that. Further, city policies must address retrofitting and adapting existing neighborhoods as a guide for new development. Pedestrians, bicycle, and transit access strategies should be emphasized. Education and culture shifts will help the city develop in a sustainable way. Many issues go beyond the city limits, and Doug will talk about those. And San Antonio must pursue regional planning and coordination, or part of a much bigger system of cities in Texas and the country. So how is all this going to be articulated to the public in terms of public engagement and dialogue? Well, these are the basic plan elements or portions of the plan where we're going to be addressing these issues in terms of solutions. Growth in urban form, transportation, housing, healthy neighborhoods, public facilities, the sustainability issues, jobs, competitiveness, the, the military, all of these are major theme areas for the plan. And we have all these working groups, each working away on each one of these areas. So why are we doing this plan right now? Well, the first one is that we're going to have a huge amount of growth here. 
just with a very conservative population estimate in the future, just births that were deaths with some immigration, the same we've had for the last 25 years, not increasing that rate, we're going to be adding over a million people to Bear County in the next 25 years. So the big question is, where should all these people go? What kind of new communities will they live in? How will they get around? What kind of services and facilities will they need? What kind of quality neighborhoods will they be going into? Will they have more choice or will we just get poor and not wealthy or more productive? These are the questions that are being answered by this planning process. Today, we have a city that's mostly suburban. Uh, it's, it's basically based on cars and freeways. Our transit system, it takes hours to get anywhere. Although millions of people ride it every year, uh, it's not the choice, a way to go. Uh, we don't have real range of choices we see in a lot of other communities across the country in terms of housing types and transportation types and job opportunities. So our future needs to really focus on changing that. San Antonio now has about 500 square miles in its city limits. There's another 600 square miles in areas that we could annex, that the city can grow into in Bear County and adjacent counties. Should we grow there? How far should we grow? These are big basic issues. We have found though, and part of the, one of the themes of the 2020 program was that we should adopt the smart growth philosophy of planning, which means try to use your existing infrastructure, use your vacant land in the city, focus growth in certain key areas, and be efficient about it, and look for alternative transportation modes. So where should growth occur? Well, one way to start is where has growth occurred? We identified about a dozen major existing and emerging growth centers in the city, you're all familiar with them. Over half of all our residential and commercial growth, mostly commercial and jobs, have been in these neighborhoods in the last 15 years. Around the airport, in Stone Oak, around UTSA, up in the northwest part of the city, around Lackland Air Force Base, and downtown, Medical Center, and then emerging areas like the a and campus on the south side, the Westover Hills area on the west side, Highway 151, the Rolling Oaks Mall, Brooks Base. These are areas that are going to congregate huge amounts of growth in the future in an alternative to continuing to sprawl for another million people north of here, uh, which is what the market would have us do all the way up towards San Marcos. We have a job base and economic structure that's been based much on tourism, military, and healthcare. That needs to be kept strong, but also there's opportunities for advanced manufacturing, better healthcare, bioscience, more military, renewable energy, enhanced education to build on our economy to provide the jobs that the people that are coming up through the schools and moving here will want to take. And housing, we have a huge housing need in San Antonio. We have 150,000 unit housing need for affordable housing, people that are spending upwards of 35 to 50 percent of their income on housing. And we have uh, rising annually average cost of new housing that's going approaching $200,000 a year, which less than half of our population can afford. Where should the new housing go? How much should it cost? What should the city do to incentivize it or promote it? These are major questions that the plans will address. And transportation, certainly that's a huge issue. This map shows right now, 2010, well, 2010, a few years ago, the red shows congested streets that are functioning really uh, sometime during the day at level of service F, which means it's, it's almost gridlock, it really is slow. And you can see that main two, Highway 281 North, those of you that live in Stone Oak, up 35 up toward New Braunfels, 1604, different areas there. You've experienced this a little bit, but the future shows in 2040, with the growth we're projecting, every one of those roads north of downtown is bright red. And it's all gridlock. We can't build our way, the solution is, out of the transportation issue and congestion issue by building more roads. We have to look at other modes. We have to look at bicycling. We have to look at pedestrian. We have to look at rail of all types and much better transit. So what do we do about all that? There's 2040. That's a, a region that does not work functionally. People don't get around. It's hugely costly, a waste of millions of time, hours of people's time. So we have to look at these alternative modes for transportation. Where do we look? Well, one place to look, as we, they're doing in Seattle, is to look at our major city. Let's see how much growth we can focus on the existing footprint of the city. And one of the major opportunity areas, in addition to those employment locations, are the major road corridors, the Culebras the Austin highways, the military highways, Bandera roads. These are major roads when you drive along many of them today, they're very underutilized, one-story buildings, very wide, very fast, not a place you want to linger. 
Uh, but other cities have turned those into really, really good residential and, and office and employment opportunities and complete streets that are safe for all modes of transportation. This is an area that we're going to be looking very carefully at. Rethinking these corridors for livability. Anybody ever think of living on Bandera Road? But it could be a really great place to live. For safety, as we've seen in Seattle, you can do that for all modes of transportation. And Terry Bellamy's uh, process is getting into great detail on that. So where are we going? In transportation and connectivity, look at transit supportive land use. Look at linking up all those major activity centers developing complete streets, focusing growth along all those transportation corridors. And growth and urban form, take those activity centers, reduce urban sprawl, try to infill development as much as possible, focus at least half, if not two-thirds of multifamily housing, most of the jobs on these major activity and growth centers, both the existing and emerging ones. For housing, provide more choice. Right now, we have walk-up apartments and we've got single-family homes. If you have more money, it's in a gated community and big lots. If you have less money, it's a smaller existing home. There are a lot more choices in other cities. There's attached units, there's townhouses, there's duplexes and cluster housing and condos and all sorts of different types of houses that can be grouped together in different kinds of community designs. All of these need to be fostered here and our codes change to be able to support that. And healthy neighborhoods and communities, communities that are walkable, Communities that have parks, communities that have walkable schools, communities that have access to good food. There's some basic, basic principles for a healthy community that we're looking at designing into the overall comprehensive plan. Keeping the military strong here. About 200,000 of our residents are tied to the military in one way or the other. We don't want those commands to leave. We want them to be welcome. We want them to be a great part of this community and continue to do so. We need to protect those bases. They're being encroached upon by suburban sprawl, by light pollution, by conflicts of reuse between their missions, and that needs to be managed very carefully. And jobs. Right now, the growth assumptions assume that we're going to have a continuation of 1% per year growth coming in um, from outside, and mostly it's for new jobs. Last year and the year before, we had more millennials moving to the city than any other in the United States. We also had a huge number of people retire here. So this is really, on both ends of the demographic spectrum, a real opportunity site. We need to keep it that way for great choices for people to live, retire, and work here. And certainly, last but not least, natural resources and environmental sustainability. We have big challenges here to do with drainage, to do with flooding. We have great opportunities here with our, our wonderful system of, of streams and valleys and hills. All this can be brought together pedestrian opportunities, trail systems, connectivity, expansions of the Riverwalk all over the community as a basic framework for the future as we grow and grow in a sustainable way. And to support all this, where do we put the fire stations, the police stations, the new parks, the new libraries? That all is derivative of this whole planning process. And we, we preserve, of course, our historic heritage. And that has to be an underlining theme through the whole thing. So the next step in the planning process, and all these working groups are coming up with really good policies and goals and, and ideas about all those themes, is to finalize these goals and then bring them out to the neighborhoods to and look at in terms of talking to the neighborhoods. We have to translate this high level, 25 year, big picture, million person growth plan into something like, what is it, how does it resonate with people? As the last speaker talked about, this is all about people. How do people live, how they work, how they go to go to school what they're going to buy, what they're going to rent, and the kind of community they want to live in, and give them those choices. So we're right now just putting together a major public outreach program to get some major feedback in from all the different communities in the city, talking about these different kinds of neighborhoods and where they should go. Next steps, we're going to be developing implementation after they have the community outreach in the next few months, just right after Christmas in January and February. The outcome of all that will be an actual draft plan that get before council probably in May. Also after that, we'll be changing the development code to implement that plan so that these new growth communities are actually feasible and not illegal as many would be today. Bond projects are initiated to help support growth where it should take place. And we begin to do more specific planning on these growth centers and corridors to make them transit supportable and livable. The outcomes we expect, more infill opportunities, better access to transit, more transit choices, growing sustainability, a connected city, 
uh, neighborhoods that have been preserved and enhanced, but with a lot more diverse housing choices in the new growth centers. And as I've just summarized, the vision, the data, the goals, and then the specific policies and implementation programs is this overall process, and we hope to get it done by spring of 2016. So that's a real quick summary of our comprehensive plan, and now Doug will talk about the sustainability plan. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, and, and thank you all um, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so I'll just cover very briefly uh, the sustainability plan, what it is, uh, some baseline information as far as why it's important that we are undertaking the sustainability plan as well as the broader essay uh, tomorrow process. So what is sustainability? Uh, you know, sustainability is really about ensuring that the, uh, the resources and the opportunities that we have today um, basically are maintained uh, now and for the future. Uh, a big high concept term. Um, it's uh, really a, um, a way of looking at the three pillars of, 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 of sustainability. Uh, it's social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Um, as we've worked with our um, stakeholders and the public, we've narrowed it to a thriving economy, uh, an inclusive and fair community, and a healthy environment. And, and sustainability really is a, um, a, a data-driven discipline. And I think that's really one of the, the keys that this can bring to the SA Tomorrow process. So why is sustainability important as well as SA Tomorrow in general? Um, I'll run through some slides very quickly. Air quality, it's no, uh, um, it's, we do have air quality challenges. We are currently the last major city in the, the country that is in attainment. Uh, EPA lowered that uh, air quality standard for ground level ozone to 70 parts per billion. And as you, as you can see on this graph, uh, we are up there with, with Dallas and, and Houston. So they're, clearly are uh, not only economic impacts associated with going in non-attainment, but there's also real public health issues. And that's directly also related to our, our, our land use patterns and our transportation choices. Economic segregation, uh, this is a map um, from, um, it was based on US Census Bureau information on economic segregation. Uh, the red areas are um, particularly segregated. And when we start talking about um, access to services and um, disproportionate impacts on communities around public health, um, we, we need to recognize that San Antonio is one of the most segregated communities in the country and how do we, we remedy that. Food systems, this map shows um, uh, percentage of population within one mile of uh, grocery supermarket or farmer's market and again the dark areas uh, represents areas that are considered food deserts so how do we remedy that through um, uh, transportation options, um, land use, and um, economic incentives and activity. Public health, uh, this is access to health care. Again, dark areas are areas that have limited access. Bike score, uh, this basically shows us our um, bikeability score. This is based upon a scale of 100. Uh, as you can see, the blue areas in the core are our most bikeable areas, but those are only up to about 57%, so even our most bikeable areas um, still need a tremendous amount of work. Same thing with walk score. Uh, the, the core is the most walkable, but again, on a scale of 100, there's still uh, plenty of opportunity for improvement. Urban heat island, uh, that is, I'm sure you're all aware, is when the, um, the, the city at the core, uh, areas of uh, buildings, asphalt, absorbs uh, heat during the day and then just radiates throughout the evening. Uh, serious public health um, impacts of that. And again, there are uh, land use um, policy decisions that can be made to try to mitigate that. Related to urban heat island is tree canopy. As you can see, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for improvements. Uh, trees um, uh, provide air quality, provide shading, um, uh, provide uh, more pleasant access for um, uh, folks who need to use transit or um, walk to services. Uh, so again, it ties into those, those three aspects of sustainability. It's the, the economic benefit, uh, the um, social, and the environmental benefit. 
park access. Uh, this shows various degrees of access for our residents to um, any park or open space. You can see there's gaps. The caveat with this map is uh, I think we need to do a little more analysis because not all parks are, are created equal. Uh, there are parks um, you know, that would be appropriate for uh, small children, and there's larger regional parks. So um, I think the takeaway from this map is there's still uh, opportunity for improvement in, in order to provide park um, space and activities for the overall health of all aspects of our community. So you know, those are some of the challenges and opportunities that we have. So why a sustainability plan? It's, it's a high level roadmap to improve our quality of life. It's a tool to help build our community's resilience. Resilience is a term that's really sort of really become very popular um, uh, throughout the, the country and, and internationally. And there's lots of debate going on uh, as far as um, what's the difference between resilience and uh, sustainability. Resilience is basically uh, your community or your neighborhood's ability to bounce forward after a, um, an impact. And, and you know, so whether it's an extreme heat event or an economic impact, how um, quickly and effectively can, can that, that community respond? And then also, as I had mentioned, it's really balancing that growth um, with all of our economic, environmental, and social resources. So I mentioned in the beginning, <clears throat> what the sustainability plan really can bring to the process is, is data. And the sustainability plan is, is focused on identifying, identifying indicators for everything that we um, uh, produce in the plan. Um, it's based upon a, a national standard. We are going through a, a program called STAR Communities, which stands for Sustainability Tools for Assessing and Rating Communities. It's the first standard nationally for um, uh, municipalities to uh, basically benchmark um, uh, all aspects of not only their municipal operations, but the community as a whole in terms of sustainability. And there's over 500 outcomes and actions that we're currently quantifying. So the key to this process is, not only is it identifying where we are excelling, but it's helping us find where those gaps are and where we need to focus on. And we're also building upon, as John was mentioning, SA 2020. That really created the vision, uh, also identified various indicators um, that the, the community decided are important to be tracked, and we're incorporating that into our, our process. And so through these indicators, we are going to basically set um, our, our targets and then track that progress and annually report as far as how we're doing to make sure we're making progress. Another really important thing that we are incorporating into our process, um, particularly I think as it relates to um, public health, is something called sustainable return on investments. And, and basically what, what that is, it's a tool that allows us to quantify those, those elements of plans, programs, and policies that are typically left out of the, the equation. And you know, an example is um, you know, a tree program, or if we suppose we want to um, uh, we identify a, a neighborhood that has limited canopy, the first question will be, well, how much is it going to cost to install and maintain these? And so the number will be presented. But that's not the end of the, the story. It's not just a cost. There's, there's benefit. There's stormwater benefit, stormwater benefit. There's health benefit. There's air quality benefit. Um, and there's economic um, benefit in terms of improved property values. So what this tool will, will do and will be piloting on a few different programs is allow us to really quantify and paint a bigger picture of, of, of these various programs and, and um, as opposed to just the cost looking at what that comprehensive benefit is. So the, again, you know, the value of a sustainability plan um, helps us identify goals to achieve vision, uh, leverages data to track our, track our progress, and um, really to provide uh, that data-driven framework for the overall SA Tomorrow process to make sure that um, you know, the, all three plans are, are shooting in the same direction and are measuring and tracking our progress. So just very briefly, there's been a considerable amount of public engagement for all three plans. And um, on the, the left is um, pre-planning surveys that took place um, before we started SA Tomorrow back in 2014. And this was the, the community was surveyed. And you can see in terms of um, sustainability and smart planning and smart transportation, those were high priorities. Uh, almost 100% of everyone that surveyed really thought that Clean air, water is important, um, uh, and su supporting multimodal activity is important. So this is something that is a strong foundation for SA Tomorrow. And then as we've undertaken the SA Tomorrow planning process, uh, a survey that was conducted by um, SA Tomorrow in 2015 identified these are the top three issues that um, were of importance to the community. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Uh, transportation, natural resources, land use, and sprawl. So clearly, those are the three elements of the overall SA Tomorrow process that are important to the community. 
So let's see if I can remember what these um, depict. So these are our focal areas for the sustainability plan, natural resources, uh, land use and transportation, uh, solid waste resources, food system, public health, uh, innovation economy, green buildings and infrastructure and energy. And then we've identified some key cross-cutting themes that will be evaluated across focal areas as being particularly important, water resources, economic vitality, air quality, resilience, and equity. And so that's basically the foundation uh, for the plan. So how do we use public engagement and how do we actually get to uh, strategies? This is an example for food system. Uh, we heard from the community, you know, 40 percent of people we spoke to referenced community gardens or grow local food. That's, that's something that they desire. Uh, that was translated into an, an outcome of increasing productive urban agriculture acreage within the community. We set a target on that, and um, the bottom right, that's a, just a draft target. We're still working through um, you know, what the, 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 the correct indicator is, but an example would be productive urban ag acreage increases by 30 to 50 percent by 2040, by a certain date, and then that leads to a series of strategies to make sure that we um, work towards meeting that, that target. So I just want to end very, very quickly, quickly on another component of our planning process, a vulnerability assessment. So you know, vulnerability is um, related to um, um, current uh, extreme weather events as well as projected um, weather events associated with climate change. Uh, you know, it's looking beyond our current historic records and looking at what those projections are and using that as a guidepost to help us start making some decisions now. I think it's a very prudent and, and conservative measure to make sure that we um, don't underestimate um, what the uh, landscape is going to look like in the next 20 to 30 years. And we've built it upon um, the foundation of the, the existing hazard mitigation action plan. Numerous other cities have already um, taken this step. Uh, these are some examples from Boston, Portland, Albany, New York, which is the one I did, um, and, and Denver. Uh, so there's a found, uh, foundation for this, this work. So what is vulnerability? It's, a, it's the intersection between climate exposure, and so that's our current climate exposure. We've extremed tremendous um, flooding recently. That is a, a climate exposure um, with sensitivity and adaptive capacity. And that's so how quickly can we um, respond to that exposure and adapt to that exposure? And the sensitivity is basically uh, how, how um, how vulnerable particular um, uh, economic um, sections of our community are. So there's definitely um, more sensitive um, uh, uh, um, demographics in our community that are of particular interest, um, seniors for one, and, and, and um, very young children. And where those intersect is, is vulnerability. So this is very, very quickly um, some of the key vulnerability assessment findings that we've seen so far, uh, and it's broken down into various categories from, from high to, to low. No um, surprise, extreme heat impacts to vulnerable populations. Um, Vector-borne diseases, as it gets warmer, as we have more increased um, extreme weather events, there's more standing water, therefore more um, uh, insect-borne diseases. Impacts to our uh, infrastructure, um, uh, transportation impacts, uh, local food security, wildfire and wildfires. And so these are things that we're using to help, um, help uh, inform um, policy recommendations and proposals and programs to help um, build in some um, capacity to prepare for those and in some ways um, pre-mitigate those. And that's all I got. Good morning, I'm Terry Bellamy with TCI, and I'm here to uh, update you on SA Tomorrow Multimodal Transportation Plan update. Um, one thing I would like to start off and say that it was great that uh, for those who had an opportunity to hear Kathy Tuttle this morning uh, talk about uh, transportation in Seattle, uh, Scott Kubley, who is the director of the Seattle uh, transportation used to work for me in Washington, D.C. So it was good to see him and many of the plans and many of the activities that are taking place across the country is continuing. One thing that I would, uh, before I go into the, the slides, and we can always talk about the, the slide decks, but changing culture is a very, very hard thing to do. 
and what's happening in San Antonio and in, in my, in my brief stay here in San Antonio is that we're starting to see a culture change of how we move around uh, San Antonio. If I would say, raise your hand if you drove today in the car by yourself during the AM rush, you will be surprised. And then I would ask how many people rode a bicycle here and parked in a bike rack out in front of the convention center or used VIA uh, for this trip today. And so what's happening is that the culture is changing. And when the culture changed, that means that the environment and the infrastructure change. The infrastructure that we're dealing with now has been built for many, many, many years. For those of you who know about the uh, FM, the farm, the market roads, uh, they were built to bring goods and services into the, the hearts of the city. And so that purpose, when they were originally built, was for that main reason, to move goods and services. And then people were also part of it. So what we're dealing with now and looking at SA Tomorrow and the Multimodal Transportation Plan is how do we recreate uh, our network and our infrastructure. I want you to just stop and think about your streets as, as you drove or walked or rode your bicycle here and look at that environment. That's one of the things that I look at every day that I'm in the city. If you look at the sidewalk that you walk, how many poles did you see along the roadway? Then the second thing I look at is, is there any green along that walkway? And I think Doug indicated about sustainability. Sustainability means life. Do we have life in that environment that we're traveling on? And then you look and see, do you have a median in the middle of the roadway that has grass, flowers, bushes? And, and what you see is, is that we see a changing environment. If you look at the new homes that are being built in the new communities, you're starting to see a lot of this. And that's where the culture change is taking place. As you look at the new development, the new residential development, you're seeing that our, our buyers are saying, this is exactly what we want. We want to see this. What am I doing? All right, so where we are in our process, we started along with the other three plans. We are now in that June, to July to January where we are evaluating, prioritizing, and developing strategies. The technical work groups had basically de 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 provided us goals that they wanted us to, to look at and manage congestion and, and safe transportation network reliable travel throughout the city, build and maintain our network, uh, improve quality of life, uh, have a multimodal transportation system, and for us to be a world leader in moving people. When our technical task force looked at it, we started looking at several corridors that we could look at to see if we can improve connectivity and enhance multimodalism, improve safety, stimulate economic development, promote livability, and then increase mobility. So we identified working with the community, working with our technical group, 12 quarters to look at. And this is just 12 quarters that can be supplanted anywhere. But looking at quarters uh, that was dealing with the growth centers and at the same time uh, adding quantitative and um, mapping methodology to see how we can improve it. Some of the corridors were actually textile corridors, but we looked at it because it's how we move around here in the community. What we then looked at is, is in that process is we started to look at what are all of the infrastructure around it. One of the key things about San Antonio, and you all know, is that we have a, a very extensive rail network in our community. One of the major concerns that we, we heard in going to the community is, is that one of the biggest obstacles to, to me being able to be mobile are the railroad crossings. And if you, 
if you travel in a corridor, you have a railroad crossing, and a train comes during the course of your morning commute, you know where that impact can be. Not only is this the occupant in the single occupant vehicle, but the buses, the pedestrians, and the bicyclists um, are, are basically at bay. What we started looking at is doing detailed study of, of how, these, how these quarters could look. Can we make them sustainable quarters? Can we make them safe quarters? What can we do to make it so that it is multimodal, it's a complete street, to be able to serve everybody that wants to use those particular infrastructure? So we looked at the right-of-way land use in those existing quarters. We looked at the geometry of the roadway. We looked at the potential of transit facilities. Uh, we worked with our uh, agencies via Long Star Rail District, TxDOT, the MPO, and we looked at challenges and opportunities. I think Kathy said, anything that you make a change, there's going to be opposition. In order to create change, you must have the will. In order to have the will, you must be able to give information to the public so they can understand why you're doing it and how you're doing it. So we, in our core of the concept, we went to different transportation partner agencies, to the communities. We did workshop to have them explain to us how they would like to see their facility. One of the terms I always ask is, what is a great street to you? And a great street to everybody is something different. So this is a sample of the concepts we looked at. The big idea was to have suburban complete street concept, accommodate transit, bicycles, improve access to adjacent communities and business. In the short term, we looked at uh, access management. When we say that is, as you ride the street, look at the number of driveways on the street. In order to have a, what I call platinum bike facilities, you cannot have 10,000 driveways running down the street. If you want to have a gold level pedestrian network, you cannot have 10,000 driveways down the street because each one of those driveways becomes a conflict point to the pedestrian, to the bicyclist, and also to the motorist. One of the key things of it is if you have all of that weaving taking place, you see that it produces opportunity to have crashes. Another option we looked at was looked at the dedication of transit lanes. We worked with the uh, via uh, Vision 2040, which they're doing their plan. We also looked at green infrastructure with, with Doug team. How do we connect the mission reach? In this quarter is military drive. And then we looked at um, rechannelization. That means the removal of lanes add barriers to separate bike facilities. We also looked at do we need wider sidewalks. The question that you always have when we go out there, is six feet enough sidewalk width on military road? Is it enough? If people are walking, is it enough? And as we went out into the communities, and it varied from community to community, what they thought was the, the ultimate width of sidewalk we need to, to carry our people and, and make them feel safe. So we looked at three scenarios. Uh, if we just go just like we're going, we looked at the scenario of, of adding uh, capacity and connect connectivity, and then we looked at the scenario three was promote all modes. It's look at what it would take to do that. Business as usual, John showed the map. The red show how the network is failing. If you look at uh, capacity and connectivity, you see that a lot of that red disappear. And then if you, uh, if you did uh, promote all, you can see that you're still going to have some red. But the question that um, I got to go back to my children, how bad is a C, Dad? Is it a high C or is it a low C? And so the question comes back is, is how bad is that F? If it's a high F or is it a low F? And so one of the things that you're going to see is, is that no network in the world has solved the problem of congestion. But the question that they got to ask is, how bad is that F? And what can we do to improve that F? So as we went through, we started looking at project prioritization, looking at the goals, looking at weighting of the, of the, the different benefits, and we looked at the scoring matrix. We looked at the proposed goals, uh, how, uh, exactly how we're going to figure this out, what it means. And then we will go through a, a scoring project of scoring projects that are going to make a difference. 
We continue to have our public uh, outreach. One of the big things that we have now, and all the bicycle staff in the back, y'all need to raise your hand. One of the big things that we're doing now is doing our outreach in our bicycle community. And one of the key things of it is, is that uh, pedestrian and bicycle, we heard a lot as we went to the community. Now what we're trying to do is pretty much what Kathy talked about. We're doing crowdsourcing for people to tell us how they bike, where they bike, how they bike. Uh, we've got a survey out there now that will be out until the 1st of December trying to get information about uh, the, the bicycle community. I've learned uh, more than enough uh, about bicycle, the different types of cyclists. Um, if you look at me, I'm, I'm basically, a, uh, I think I'm a utility cyclist. I, can, I have a car, but I can ride and go to the store to dry clean, and I love doing that. And, you know, over 60 years old, you need to exercise, but at the same time, you got to look at the network for the people that are using it as a commute to and from work. We also asked the community in that time is, is where should the city focus its funding? And as you can see, safety, uh, congestion management, reliability, quality of life, and maintenance rose to the top. But then the question that we're going to dig down to is what do you mean about safety? What do you mean about congestion management? Because as I said, we can never solve congestion. We can move it. We can't solve it. Because as the community grows by a million people in the network we got, there will be times where there will be congestion on our roadway. We, we also looked at other funding methods. We asked what you like, what you didn't like. Because when you look at what it would take to continue to build our network, if we would build our um, thoroughfare plan as we have it today, Rough estimate is $2.8 billion just to complete what's on the thoroughfare plan now, not taking into account what would be needed as we add a million additional people. Uh, we continue to do public information and outreach. Uh, you can see the picture of Seclovia. Uh, we are out as, as much and in, in, in possible. We will be doing a town hall webinar uh, the end of the month. We welcome people to continue to give us feedback. Uh, we use Facebook, have reached about 123,000 people. Our Twitter account, about 98,000. Uh, we've got about four, 40 new followings uh, in the last month and constantly using it. But right now, what we're switching to is we're actually going back to the grassroots movement. The social media has played a major role, and now we're actually going back door to door. Uh, going to the various uh, interest groups to be able to, to help us in finalizing this plan as we go into the first of the year. Um, we will have uh, focus groups in December. Uh, if you're interested, please go to our web page or you can call us if you're interested in participating. We'll be putting out our new e-newsletter as well as uh, continue to brief uh, our elected officials and what we've heard. Uh, I, I keep going back to Kathy. It's very important that we involve our elected officials in understanding what the public is telling us, what they want to see in the community uh, by year 2040. So in a nutshell, we have gone almost a year with a tremendous amount of outreach. We've heard a lot of different things. There are different ones in different communities. But one of the things that I want to leave you with, and, and, and again, listen to Kathy, and it's like flashback deja vu. One of the biggest things of it is, is everybody don't use every mode of transportation. And when we come in and we say that this is an ideal street for rechannelization, and we can put bike facilities on your roadway, and the first thing that they say is, I don't ride a bike. And I don't want anybody riding a bike in front of my house. But the key of it is, is, is that I think I know that bicycling is going to be more and more important in this community as we grow to tw the year 2040. And it's very important to understand just because you don't use that service is not a reason to discount it. And whatever we can do to help educate the public by having that option, it makes a world of difference of how our community stands up as a walkable, safe, and a very innovative community. Because we're competing for growth, job growth, housing growth. We are the seventh largest city in America. 
Austin is the 11th largest city, and some of the fastest growing cities in America are between San Antonio and Austin. We will be a mega region, and we must be able to deal with that mega, mega region by year 2040. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Terry and Doug. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left for any kind of questions or comments. Mike's on either side here. Yes, sir. Hello, good morning. Well, first of all, Terry and Doug and John, thank you very much. I mean, the, the task that you're taking is overwhelming, and the amount of work that it seems that you put into this, it, it's, it's amazing. Which brings me to the point, uh, I'm Christian Sandoval, and I'm, I, my organization started Earn a Bike, the Bicycle Co-op, which focuses on youth development the Bike Collective, that we're trying to unify the cycling community, and the Women's French Night, which is about empowerment. Now, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked my colleagues in, in, in the back, as you mentioned, is how can we help? Because your timeline is very aggressive. We're going fast. And these organizations that I've spoke to you about and, and the community has just recently gotten into it. We're barely starting to get organized. We don't have time to lose, to become angry and go through the fighting and do all these things that all these organizations do to try to get a voice and sit down and collaborate. If we all have the same goal and we want to collaborate, what do you expect from our organizations? How can we contribute and get side by side aligned with what you're doing so we can contribute versus hindering? Okay. Terry, do you want to comment on that? Oh, I. I I've got to thank him. We met with his organization a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is continue to have uh, the dialogue, and uh, we actually asked them to help us design the plan for their various organizations to uh, basically identify areas. I think Kathy indicated that with their latest bike plan update, the bike community actually designed it. Uh, the bike master plan was done in San Antonio in 2011. It was updated in 2014. And so now we're just in another update. So we're not recreating the wheel. We're just adding the new technologies and, and, and new things that was not in the 2014 plan, like protected bike lanes, uh, green bike boxes, uh, being able to identify networks with the linear park, with the linear creek system. So. The way we can continue to work is continue to meet, to continue to have dialogue, and the uh, MPO had just finished a pedestrian bike update for the, for the area, and that would be a part of it. So we're not starting from fresh. It's just building on what's there and what's happened since the last update in 2014. Do you want to come in? Okay. Question here. Yes, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, about four years ago, we had a presentation uh, over at AIA at the Pearl that um, was from a couple of professors out in San Francisco, and they had this dramatic wake-up call, which was um, for the Bay Area communities, every mile closer they lived to their workplace, they could afford another $15,000 worth of house mm -hmm. based off of savings on transportation, personal savings on transportation. And I don't see anyone taking this to heart on an education level here in San Antonio saying, you know, we're getting to be a big city. We're almost too big for our britches. And you know, we, we have a situation where um, people discount the commute. They just take it for granted. And then when it doesn't work, they jump up and down and say, hey, where's my transportation system? And it's like, well, truly, uh, 500 square miles a city. You, you can't live on one end and work on the other and have a reasonable expectation of not spending one month a year sitting in your car. And we're wondering, what, what is everyone thinking about as far as an education component on this? Uh, rather than just letting it be uh, under-informed market forces. Thank you. Well, let me comment on part of the issue, and then perhaps Terry can comment on the other. To do with the low, lower income population, that has been quantified. The 150,000 person or unit need that have been defined by HUD, the biggest portion of that is the cost of transportation to work, and that's put into the factor of, of housing cost. We have 150,000 households, that's half a million people here that are spending 35 to 50 percent of their income because they have to utilize, they don't have transit that they can get to work. If they do, it's not very good, so they have to have a car, they have to have two cars. And the more you can reduce the number, the car dependence, the more money's left over for housing and costs for mortgages and rents and food. 
So at the lower income levels, that is a huge impact that's beginning to be quantified. At the upper income level, again, if you could switch from one car, two cars to one car, three cars to two cars, it makes a huge difference. The kind of planning we're talking about, the infill and the corridors, the growth centers, the reduction of sprawl, the smart growth approach is basically designed to allow a community to be built that you don't have to be so car dependent and you can move off of the, all the different car options there. Anybody want to yeah, And one of the indicators that we are looking at, you're probably familiar with the Center for Neighborhood Technologies Housing and Transportation Index, and so it clearly defines what those costs are. And so I think it's as we start rolling out the policies and the programs, tying it to education so people understand you know, what the, um, there may be costs, but what the benefits are. People need to understand that big picture of, of um, the implications that you mentioned. That was a great comment. $10,000 a car. That's the savings that you would have if you got rid of one of the cars that you own. Uh, the big issue facing us is, is that we don't have uh, premium transit in San Antonio. If you look at the major cities, the light rails, the commuter rails, uh, the jitneys, uh, we don't have that yet, and that's one of the things that we'll be addressing in the study, is how do you make transportation and moving great portions um, without having to get an automobile? And that's a, bit, that's a big issue that we've got to deal with. And if we can build more housing close to our jobs, uh, we've got huge areas like the medical center with 55,000 employees and one apartment complex and a walkable access to that uh, big, huge employment complex. That's another approach that we're going to be focusing on. Sir, another question? Yes, thank you. I'm Steve Blanchard. I'm on the board of the Bear County Health Collaborative. We're one of the uh, sponsors of this uh, meeting. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for what you're doing as a citizen. Uh, I thank you very much and very much in support of the plan. But I would like to ask a question. There's substantial evidence out there that the built environment heavily influences population health of a community. And it seems like a lot of your indicators are process in terms of changing the built environment or in terms of improving sustainability. Um, but I don't see, even in the STAR, much of uh, indicators in terms of what gain will the community get in terms of population health as a result in the change in the built environment. If you have those health indicators, which I, I'm, I'm sure you must, it would be, I think, good to put it out in front of the community so that the community can see what gain in health we will see over the next 20 to 40 years. I mean things like improved life expectancy, improvement in cause-specific mortality, things in, like obesity. It would give us a good logic for the value of the plan. Thank you. Go to talk, comment on that? Uh, um, yeah, I think one of the, the challenges that we've had is there are, um, and the process that we've been going through is trying to identify what are the appropriate indicators. So I think your point is, is, is well taken. And so I think um, as we reach out to stakeholders and to the community, that's the sort of feedback that we're, we're looking for so we can really pin down what those key indicators are. I think I, I can suggest to you that there are, uh, there's considerable literature out there that will uh, inform you as to what those indicators are. There's a, quite a lot of number of them and you can, through focus groups, figure out the ones that are most important to the community that community would think would be the most effective monitoring of the improved health. There's substantial literature out there that will help you do that. Right. And, and, and there we, are key people in the community that are already yeah, doing And we do that. work with a, I think all three plans work with steering committees of um, um, subject matter experts. Uh, so there's more, there's more to it than what was presented. And so, but um, definitely we'll, we'll take that into consideration. All right, good point. We have room, uh, time for one or two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Catherine Velasquez. Um, so I wanted to mention to you, Mr. Dugan, uh, and it kind of goes in lines with what uh, Mr. Blanchard was saying, is that on those common themes that you put, um, there's no mention of health. I mean, not health of people, you know, it might be economic health or so on, but there really needs to be that theme of health. And um, I know that is important to you in, in the, the comprehensive plan and so on, but it really needs to be in that common theme and mention there. And then the other thing is that, um, um, uh, Mr. Milnick, you were talking about, you know, that there's improvement in, the, in new development uh, in terms of, I guess, reaching health and that we're addressing that a little bit more. But I don't know. I've been doing some driving out in the, you know, far northwest reaches and Stone Oak area and just beyond. And there are destinations, but they're not within active transportation reach. I mean, you have these really huge 
neighborhoods, and if you want people to um, use their car less, you have to put destinations within mm -hmm. an active transportation reach. I have to be able to walk to it, or I'm gonna have to get into my car, or bike to it, I'm gonna have to get into my car. Right. And I, th I think that's the process that we're undertaking now right. is to you know identify um, what are those land use patterns? What are the um, those destinations? And and through that, develop the the policies and the programs to make sure we get right. There. We have a whole city that's developed around cars. So to un to change that option, to change that whole culture, and to change that physical form is going to be a huge multi-year, twenty-year process. Right. What we're doing now with all these plans is laying out a vision and a pathway there. The implementation is going to take decades. I wish we could do it before the areas end up getting developed, you know? I mean, because right. it's hard to go back into the community, but in these, I guess, new communities, then that needs to be a piece of it. And then I guess another piece is for the existing um, areas, you know, that we really somehow incentivize, um, I guess, rebuilding that infrastructure, of putting back smaller shops and smaller corridors of Right, and that, that may be easier to do. <laughs> okay, one last question here. Yes, I had a question. Uh, my name is Hudi Vega, and I had a question about um, how economic equity is being considered in all of the plans. Um, because, you know, in the health department, we do work in a lot of low income neighborhoods um, that are solely minority communities. And people do bike, people walk, people ride trans, you know, transit out of necess economic necessity and not necessarily out of livability, you know, considerations. And, you know, I guess I'd just like to ask where, where that substantial population within the city, that their voice be heard and that they're, um, that within this plan, if it's too late to develop mechanisms that they can really kind of bring their considerations and not be left out of the conversation. Right, well, equity is a merging theme. And certainly it's a sustainability theme, but it's also a transportation theme and a land use theme. Um, we are developing now a major outreach program to listen to people of all different incomes in different parts of the city. That will happen after Christmas and to a great focus for several months. And so there'll be very great opportunities for people to be engaged. And we'll be making an effort to really engage the people that usually aren't heard from. I, I just would ask that it, you consider, you know, culturally really getting into the community, you know, barbershops, beauty, beauty salons, um, churches, places where people really are and where people really gather rather than calling public meetings and providing no child care, no food yeah, um, in the morning when people can't come. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've gone to um, uh, school, um, school equipment giveaways in, in the east side and you know we've made sure that we're going to those areas where um, uh, stakeholders um, are as opposed to at just asking them to come to the meeting so it is definitely part of our process thank you okay i think the time's up so thank you all for and keep engaged do you have questions about supporting this this is going to be a political process eventually when it gets to city council and so your support is certainly uh, required and engagement as we get into after the New Year's this big engagement process. Come and talk to us and we will listen. Thank you.